Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour euh, et, et bienvenue à cet événement organisé par euh, le Geneva Environment Network, mais également l'ambassade, euh, la, la, la représentation permanente plutôt euh, de la Grande-Bretagne et de l'Italie à Genève. Uh, welcome everyone and really thanks to our speakers for joining us in uh, the Palais and uh, in thanks to the UN also for hosting us uh, for this meeting. It is really a pleasure to be back in this room. Um, as uh, you know, uh, in November, the UK, together with Italy, uh, will host um, an event that many believe is the last chance uh, to fix our climate, to get our climate under control. And uh, we know that for nearly three decades, and maybe even more, uh, the United Nations, including the United Nations Environment Programme, which I represent today, has been bringing together uh, uh, countries on Earth uh, around, around the issue of climate change and, and organized uh, through the NFCCC what we call COPS, the Conference of the Parties. And uh, in Glasgow this year, it's going to be the 26th edition of these COPS. So what have we done uh, in 26 editions? A lot has been done. First of all, we've brought climate change from uh, One, one of the priority to being the global priority and really the issue that uh, governments, civil society, private sector and the United Nations are concentrating their efforts on. Uh, climate change, as you know, is part of the triple planetary crisis that we are facing together with pollution and biodiversity. And on these three crises, the time for action is uh, really now. And uh, we hope, we've got great hopes, for uh, this COP26 on the action it will deliver uh, to limit climate change uh, to uh, the 1.5 degrees that the Paris Agreement has agreed upon. Um, we will hear uh, today from a, a, ver a variety of speakers about the expectations of this COP26 and how we can then move forward the outcomes of the COP to the International Geneva because we all have a role to play in this city to deliver the outcome. Uh, we will be also pleased to hear uh, uh, and welcome one of the winners of the Earthshot Prize. Uh, and the Earthshot Prize is uh, uh, a new prize awarded by the Royal Household of uh, the United Kingdom uh, to uh, a number of, of citizens who have engaged themselves uh, on tackling the climate crisis. So we will hear this uh, from one of the winners announced last Sunday, and we will hear from her Uh, on uh, what efforts she's, she's, she's making to fix our climate, and that's what the prize is all about. In terms of format, uh, we will hear all the speakers, one after the other. I'll, I'll be moderating the session, and then we'll go into a Q&A uh, session. And you're very welcome to participate from the room or at home, because many of you are online. Submit your question and ask to speak uh, that, will be, uh, that will be announced when you are allowed to speak online or in the room. And of course, join us on Facebook Live, on Twitter, on at UK Mission Geneva and at Gen Network. Really, thanks a lot to everyone uh, for joining. And let me also add a small word of thanks to uh, Switzerland, the host country, but also uh, the main uh, uh, sponsor and, and supporter of the Geneva Environment Network. Uh, which, as I said, is part of the organization. I would like now to uh, turn to Ambassador Simon Manley of the UK Permanent Mission in Geneva uh, and let him open the floor and tell us about the importance of this COP26. Ambassador, over to you. Um, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Bruno, for that very warm uh, introduction. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with such a uh, distinguished uh, panel uh, of real specialists uh, in this area. And it's great to be sat uh, alongside my dear friend, the uh, Italian ambassador, Ambassador Conardo, Gian Lorenzo, Fondrulno. Uh, it's great to be doing this in collaboration uh, with our Italian uh, partners. And uh, look, Bruno, I think you've, you've said it very well. Um, we face a turning point for humanity, I think as our Prime Minister put it, uh, in New York. Um, we all know the science. It's compelling, incontrovertible, and we see now 
all too clearly, perhaps tragically, this summer, the real world effects of climate change. Um, so there can be no doubt about the scale of the challenge, the, uh, the immediacy of the challenge and the responsibility that we uh, and Italy have to deliver a successful uh, COP26 in Glasgow to ensure that we can deliver on the ambition that we set in Paris six years ago to ensure that we can actually reach this target of keeping climate change within 1.5 degrees. We recognize how deeply challenging that is. Uh, and the scale of the effort that we need to undertake as hosts, along with Italy, uh, the scale of the collaboration that we need with other governments, with civil society, with business, with the media, to explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the part that we can all play as governments, as businesses, and as consumers, too, uh, in ensuring that we... Uh, achieve these targets. What are we trying to achieve in, in Glasgow? Well, as I say, it's about, you know, essentially it is about ensuring that we implement that sense of ambition that we set ourselves uh, in Paris. Uh, it's about ensuring that we put in place the, the mitigation measures, the adaptation measures. We've obviously got a big meeting coming up on that uh, next Monday. The finance uh, to ensure that we fulfill that commitment that we set ourselves of 100 billion dollars of climate finance every year between 2020 and 2025, and it's about collaboration, as I said, between governments, business, consumers, uh, and uh, civil society. Um, we like to put it in terms, too, of, uh, we, love, we love alliteration in the UK. We, we talk of cash, cars, coal, cows, and trees. Trees, I know, is not very alliterative, but the rest is. Uh, cash, well, just said, that 100 billion of climate finance that we need to enable countries to make the transition and to ensure that they address the vulnerabilities uh, that are being uh, caused by climate change. Cars, shorthand for mobility. It's about making this uh, extraordinary transition that we're going to have to make from the kind of the gas-guzzling uh, reality of 2021 to a future in which uh, mobility is more public uh, and more electric. Uh, and we've set out some of that ourselves as a government just this week in our own uh, net zero plans. Uh, net zero plans, which I'd say, kind of where we try and make it a case for, you know, the uh, net zero also being a net win for people, businesses, and our planet. Uh, coal very much subject at the moment, but we all, know, we all know that we need to change the way that we generate the energy that we all use as businesses, uh, as governments, as individuals. We need to get off our dependence upon coal, uh, and we've set ourselves that target that uh, all developing countries need to have phased out coal by 2040, but that actually in the developed world, we need to be more ambitious still, uh, and we need to have phased it out by 2030. Cows might sound flippant, but actually, uh, cows are an enormously important source of methane, one of the most damaging greenhouse gases, and we need to find new, more sustainable uh, ways uh, in our agriculture, and we have the tech to do that. Trees, you mentioned biodiversity, it's vital that we end and reverse the deforestation of our planet. Uh, that's important in so many ways, important in terms of biodiversity. It's obviously vital in terms of the role that our forests play as a carbon uh, sink. Um, uh, in doing all this, I think it's really important to recognize that we have the tech. We really do. And we've, we've seen it ourselves in the UK in the way that we have been able to grow as an economy over the last uh, few years while at the same time reducing our carbon emissions. Yeah? So over the last 30 years, our economy is growing by 75% and our emissions have fallen by 44%, not least uh, through the enormous investments that we've been putting into sustainable energy, becoming a global leader, for example, uh, in offshore uh, wind. It's doable. It just requires the political will of governments 
and the actions by individual businesses and consumers to make this change and to ensure that Glasgow, not the end of a process, but the beginning of this extraordinary transition that we have to go through uh, to avoid uh, breaching that 1.5 degree limit. And just to pick up on your last point, uh, Bruno, just before I conclude, and that's to say that Geneva has a really important role to play in this. I, I speak of Geneva as the kind of the implementing arm, if you like, of this climate effort. Each and every head of UN organizations or indeed other international organizations who I meet here in Geneva talks about climate as probably the biggest issue they face. Whether that's in terms of trade or health or migration or refugees. And we, working together here in Geneva, on the back of a successful COP, can play a crucial role in ensuring that we deliver on what we agree in Glasgow. And as UK Mission, we look forward to working with our partners, whether they be Gian Lorenzo and his colleagues in the Italian Mission, our partners across the permanent missions here, but also the UN organizations, other international organizations here, civil society, and the businesses based here in Geneva. That's the task ahead for us, and we look forward to seizing it and making success of it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. And uh, really, I think indeed that, as you mentioned, science is really, really clear about the challenge we are facing, and, and it's doable, however. And that's really what we, we need to, to think, uh, going to the COP in a positive mind, that it's doable. And earlier this month, we concluded the pre-COP meeting in Milan, uh, and it brought together climate and energy ministers who discussed and exchanged views on, on key political aspects of the negotiations. And they looked at the key topics that will be addressed at COP26. As the COP26 presidency partner, Italy hosted this pre-COP indeed, and joining us today to give us an insight into the real developments that took place at this pre-COP, we've got Ambassador Carnaro from the Permanent Mission of Italy. Ambassador. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Simon, for hosting this initiative. It's great to be sitting with you and to prepare together with you the most important event of the year. Mr. Ambassador, distinguished panelists, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me at this important event in preparation of COP26, which will be held in Glasgow from October 31st to November 12th. As you know, Italy, in its capacity of COP26 co-chair, hosted a pre-COP and a Youth for Climate Summit last September in Milan. On the occasion of this extraordinary event, 400 leaders, young leaders coming from across the world have been able to present their proposals for tackling the climate change to the COP26 president-designate and to the environment minister from more than 50 countries. The real and wider involvement of an important non-state actor, such as the youth in the negotiation process, is the main result of the four days dedicated to climate change in Milan, reducing inequalities, involving young people in decision-making processes, encouraging a, a public-private aid program are just some of the proposals that came out of the meetings. Last September 29th, the Plenary Assembly of the Youth for Climate Summit approved key messages, structures around four pillars. In the first pillar, named Youth Driving Ambition, the young leaders asked for their involvement in decision-making processes. In the second pillar, Sustainable Recovery, they call for an urgent, diversified, and inclusive energy transition by 2030 and for nature-based solutions. In the third one, concerning non-state actors' engagement, the young leaders ask the private sector to, to align current and future operations and their supply chain with net zero emissions. Finally, the fourth pillar on climate conscious society was a pledge for Minister of Education and Environment to support climate change education and youth empowerment. These recommendations were presented by young representatives of the Youth for Climate Summit at the opening of the, of the pre-COP on September 30th and discussed with over 50 ministers, members of the UNFCCC Secretariat, presidents of the subsidiary bodies of the Convention, and a number of civil society actors. The final document of the summit will be released on October 24th and will be presented in Glasgow. When meeting the delegates at the pre-COP pre high-level event, Prime Minister Draghi said, 
First of all, we have to face this transition in an equitable way, and many of you, all of you, have said today that this way must be inclusive. Inclusive means including the poorest countries, the most fragile, and including you, young people. We cannot imagine doing anything in this field without your participation in decision-making processes. For the first time, young leaders were allowed to present their recommendations to the pre-COP, usually restricted to ministers and experts in the field of climate change, and their message will have a concrete follow-up in Glasgow as well. This inclusive approach has been an opportunity to hear their voices and to have a broader perspective that will foster innovative elements and new ideas for the future. The hope is that Youth for Climate will not be a one-off event. The pre-COP preparatory meeting took also place in Milan from September 30th to October 2nd, just after the Youth for Climate Summit, and brought together climate and energy ministers from more than 50 countries, representing the, the major CO2 emitters, the most vulnerable, the most ambitious, and regional constituencies, to discuss and exchange views on some key political aspects of the negotiations and delve into some of the key negotiating topics that will be addressed at COP26. They discussed their expectations for the COP26 outcome and provided guidance on outstanding negotiations issues. Building on the conversation of the July ministerial meeting in London, pre-COP was the final formal multilateral opportunity for ministers to shape the negotiations in detail ahead of the forthcoming meeting in Glasgow. The agenda for pre-COP consisted of seven topics. Keeping 1.5 alive, scaling up adaptation, loss and damage, finalizing the Paris rulebook, Article 6, transparency and common time frames, and mobilizing finance. Robust and detailed discussion took place in a combination of plenary and breakout groups, and a number of ministers and heads of delegation were invited to support because of facilitation. The goal of the pre-COP meeting was to maintain the credibility of the Paris objective of containing the rise in global temperature as close as possible to 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial levels through the adoption of new and ambitious NDCs. During the pre-COP, many saw the clear spirit of collaboration that inspired the negotiation, which will be helpful to find points of agreement in Glasgow. After young leaders and government, the parliaments of the world took the stand as well in a meeting recently held in Rome to support the common effort towards a successful country to COP26. Indeed, we did the mobilization of all stakeholders, state and non-state actors. This is an issue closely linked to the need that the most developed countries keep their commitment to jointly mobilize $100 million billion a year by 2025 in favor of developing countries. This is an indispensable requirement for the successful outcome of the, of the negotiations. Ladies and gentlemen, an important task awaits the United Kingdom at COP26 after Milan for Youth for Climate and Pre-COP to make sure that concrete climate objectives will be set, ensuring the credibility of our net zero targets and the sustainability of the Paris Agreement. As for Milan, it will also give the opportunity to those who will inherit our planet to voice their concern and give their perspective and concrete input. I wish the United Kingdom and the city of Glasgow all the best and all success of COP26. Italy, as a co-chair, will continue to give its full support. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ambassador. And, and I take from your speech as well these issues of, indeed, equitability, inclusivity, and the intergenerational character of uh, the transition. No one can be left behind. That's what the United Nations is also saying. And it's really important that we are focused on this as we move with the seven topics you've underlined that are really the key uh, topics for the conference. And the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, as you know, UNFCCC, as we say, agreed in uh, 1992 and set in place is the international treaty that uh, fights uh, climate change. It, it is also the operating body of uh, the international climate negotiations, and that's what uh, got us to the Paris Agreement and, and, and now to COP26. To tell us about uh, the developments in the negotiations, what, what we can anticipate from their perspective, we are joined by uh, Ovai Samat, the Deputy Executive Secretary of, of UNFCCC, who is joining us online. We've got Ovai with us. Over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. If I may uh, refer to you with your first name, and Ambassador Manley, Ambassador Coronado. It's a great pleasure to share this panel with you, and uh, it's also uh, a distinct pleasure to address the distinguished audience in Geneva, which has been my place uh, for, and home and workplace for over 25 years. And I know the uh, the importance of Geneva humanitarian community there. So therefore, this uh, event is extremely important, very meaningful at this time, uh, 10 days before the COP26. And I'd like to share a few thoughts with you uh, from UNFCCC perspective. We meet at a crucial, crucial moment. Uh, as I said, 10 days until the beginning of COP26 in Glasgow. And very honestly, we are all very excited, but at the same time, very nervous. Uh, having to plan uh, this event, which is attracting huge attention from around the world, from all sectors of the society, uh, to address uh, something that uh, we all know is an existential crisis that the world is facing. And the expectations are huge. And more specifically, to get back on track towards limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, as has already been said. Uh, very briefly, as of today, we are intensely working uh, very closely with our UK, uh, the UK host of the uh, COP, uh, uh, together also with the Italian government, who is the co-host of the COP uh, in Glasgow. And so far, uh, yeah, there's 28,000 participants have registered, and the number is growing every day. So this is uh, coming to be a COP which will most likely be almost on par with what we experienced in Paris. And uh, we are working very closely, intensely, as you can imagine, to provide a very safe and secure environment uh, for the conference, especially in the midst of the pandemic that we are all uh, going through. Success at COP, and I'll come back to this a bit later, is more than one or two big announcements on the media. Success is the development of a balanced package of decisions and actions, reflecting the expectations, concerns, and needs of all stakeholders in multiple areas, all set against a backdrop of ambition, as was already highlighted by Ambassador Manley. And we have seen in the past two years, since the outbreak of the coronavirus, that emergencies are never restricted by borders. It is the same with respect to climate change. You all know this very well. An emergency dwarfing COVID-19 and with future impacts that will become far greater if we don't take measures to deal with it today, and especially at the COP. We are often so focused on national interests and financial concerns that we often overlook to see the big picture. Climate change is the biggest long-term challenge of hum humankind. It impacts everyone everywhere. Even recently, regions across the Americas, Europe, or Central Asia have seen extreme temperatures never experienced before by humans. Climate change is not some distant threat. It is here and now. Yet we have an opportunity, a fantastic opportunity, I believe, and I personally commit to working towards it, uh, to address it right now. In, as I said, a 10 day stand at the COP, and I'll come back to the specifics of that in a minute. What does science tell us? Here, I would mention two aspects. The most recent IPCC report points out that we need rapid, sustained, and large-scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees. And very recently, also, our secretariat issued an NDC synthesis report. While some nations have strong national climate action plans, others need to support more to bend the curve. There will be considerable rise in the global greenhouse gas emissions projected to increase by, unfortunately, 16% in 2030 compared to 2010. This is a red coat for the planet and humankind. So what can be done? After six years since adoption of the Paris Agreement, adoption was something, but implementation needs to happen. COP26 represents a huge opportunity to mobilize all stakeholders to take action towards its implementation and release its full potential to address, as was already mentioned, adaptation, mitigation, transparency of action, and means of implementation. 
We have seen that in Tricop, in Milan, uh, under the hosting of uh, the Italian government. A lot of very strong and uh, very meaningful commitments have been made. And uh, as, as Ambassador Coronado said, the report will be presented to the COP in, uh, in 10 days' time. As I mentioned earlier, we need four key success at COP. Now, let me very briefly highlight what those are. First is to fulfill promises. As I said, a lot of commitments have been made uh, before and uh, agreements have been adopted, but those need to be materialized, operationalized, if there is such a term. And in particular, the 100 billion pledge that was made 10 years ago in the UNFCCC process to provide funding to develop countries or countries at the forefront of climate uh, crisis. Second is to wrap up unfinished work. Pending items such as Article 6, which is to do with carbon markets, transparency framework, or adaptation, the global goal and adaptation need to be finalized to ensure progress on many other areas of climate action. Third is to, uh, as was already also mentioned, commit to more ambition. The national climate action plans and long-term strategies put forward by parties have to be much, much more ambitious and get us to climate neutrality by 2050. And last but not least, ensure that all voices are heard. Parties and non-party stakeholders need to collaborate in a spirit of inclusive multilateralism. A successful COP means positive engagement of observers, other non-party stakeholders in taking climate action, especially the civil society and the youth, uh, which were very active at the pre-COP in Milan. UNFCCC initiatives such as Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action and Race to Zero campaign should deliver meaningful contributions to climate action and promote climate ambition globally. And I very much invite all uh, who are here today and through your contacts and uh, influences to invite all of you to engage in those activities. Every day that goes by without being able to implement Paris Agreement is, I believe, a full day wasted. Inaction is the result of an inability to make difficult decisions and failing to decide may end up being the same as deciding to fail. COP26 is our opportunity to get it right. As I said right at the beginning, the Geneva diplomatic community, especially the humanitarian community, has an extremely important role to play in this regard. And I very much welcome your engagement and we are ready to help uh, support you and engage with you as best as we can uh, to get us through the COP26 with very robust and transformative decisions. Thank you very much and back to you, Bruno. Thanks a lot, uh, Ovais, and, and really let me quote you again. Uh, failing to decide is to decide to fail. This is really a key message. We need to turn the commitment into action. We need very high ambition and we can't leave anyone uh, behind. So this call for implementation, and as you said, we can't lose another day of aid, is sustained by science. And the, in the summer, uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the world's leading scientific body on climate science, has issued another uh, stark warning from its secretariat here in Geneva. And we joined online as well uh, by Valérie Masson-Delmotte, who co-chairs the IPCC's Working Group 1, which is the one examining the physical science underpinning the past, present and future of climate change. Uh, Valérie is going to uh, tell us where we stand on the science and what it tells us in terms of our global goals. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, ambassadors and dear participants. Thank you for this opportunity to share, as you stressed, uh, the key findings from uh, the IPCC 2021 climate report. It reflects major science advances from multiple lines of evidence, observations, insights from past climates, understanding of the drivers and processes shaping the climate system changes with insights from global and regional models. It's also a reality check. Where are we now? It's now an established fact that human activities have warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land, driving ice melt and leading to widespread, rapid 
and intensifying changes. The magnitude and scale of current changes are unprecedented over thousands of years. If we look at the level of global warming, it's now reaching 1.1 degrees Celsius over the last decade compared to the late 19th century. And it is now unequivocal that all of this warming is human caused. The warming effect from heat trapping gases is dominated by our emissions of carbon dioxide and methane, resulting from the use of fossil fuels, but also deforestation, agricultural and industrial activities and waste. It's partly masked by the cooling effect due to short-lived pollution. Human-caused climate change is affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, strengthening the frequency and intensity of extreme events such as heat waves, heavy precipitation events, drought or fire weather. We've set in motion the slow components of the climate system that will adjust over decades or more for glaciers, centuries for the deep ocean and thousands of years for ice sheets. As a result, sea level is already committed to continue to rise. The changes we already experience will increase with any further warming. So where are we going? In this report, we consider five future emission scenarios, ranging from very low, low, intermediate, to high or very high future greenhouse gas emissions. As you can see on the slide, if greenhouse gas emissions remain close to today's level during just a few decades, the intermediate scenario in yellow, then global warming of 1.5, would be exceeded in the next 20 years, two degrees by the 2050s, and it would reach three degrees in the next century. However, if rapid and deep reductions in carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gas emissions are achieved in the coming years and continue decade after decade, then as you can see in dark blue or light blue, global warming could remain close to 1.5 degrees Celsius and well below two degrees. In all cases, global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, averaged over 20 years, is expected to be reached in the next 20 years. This means that by the 2030s, there would be one chance out of two that every single year has an annual temperature 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Why does every increment of further warming matters? Many changes in the climate system become larger in direct relation to increasing global warming. This includes average temperature increase and precipitation change in every region, increases in the frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation and hot extremes, including harmful heat thresholds, drought in some regions, the proportion of intense tropical cyclones, as well as reductions in snow cover, permafrost, and Arctic sea ice. A warmer climate also intensifies the water cycle and its variability, including very wet and very dry climate events and seasons with implications for flooding and drought. A warmer climate affects the ocean in multiple ways that are important for marine life and people who depend on it. This includes intensified marine heat waves, loss of oxygen, and ocean acidification. These multiple changes are more pronounced and widespread for every increase in future warming and can be stopped by limiting warming. However, some consequences from past and future greenhouse gas emissions are irreversible over centuries to millennia, especially sea level rise which is already accelerating, and the resulting intensification of extreme sea level events. Limiting warming would allow to slow and limit the scale of sea level rise, giving more time to adapt in low-lying coastal zones. Finally, abrupt changes such as ice sheet collapse, ocean circulation change, forest dieback, compound extreme events, they cannot be ruled out. Limiting warming reduces the probability that such low likelihood, but potentially high impact outcomes will occur. From a physical science basis, 
What is needed to limit future warming? Science is clear. Every ton of CO2 emissions adds to global warming. CO2 has a cumulative effect. And as a result, limiting human-induced global warming to any level requires limiting the total cumulative CO2 emissions, reaching net zero CO2 emissions as soon as possible, along with strong reductions in other greenhouse gas emissions, and in particular, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in methane emissions would limit the warming effect resulting from declining aerosol pollution. And through the effect of methane on ozone in the surface, it would improve air quality. Reducing global greenhouse gas emissions would lead, within a few years, to discernible effects on atmospheric composition and improve air quality relative to high global greenhouse gas emissions. We would see the effects for trends in global surface temperature within around 20 years. The climate we experience in the future depends on the decisions that you take now. I finally would like to flag that the latest scientific knowledge is available with, with a strategy of open science and open data to inform your choices so as to prepare for unavoidable changes and limit the scale of associated risks. For instance, using our interactive atlas, you can make your own maps, explore the synthesis of changes in climate characteristics that matter for impacts in your region and access the underlying data. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mrs. Masson, that much, uh, Valérie, for uh, this very, very clear presentation and, and for sharing the science which is uh, behind the crisis and that we are facing. And, and when future generations will look back, they will say they knew about talking about us. So, so we need to take this action and, and get uh, results from COP26. Now, part of the solution to address the issue uh, that has been presented will have to come as well from our natural systems. And climate change, while it poses a risk as well to biodiversity, uh, can also take the power of nature to, uh, we can also take the power of nature to mitigate uh, the emissions through measures like conservation, good ecosystems management and restoration of the world's ecosystems. That's why we are joined by uh, Sandeep uh, Sengupta of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, who leads uh, the climate change portfolio to speak uh, now about the challenges and opportunities for the natural world uh, when it comes to COP26 and the climate change uh, crisis. Sandeep, over to you. Thank you, Bruno. Ambassador Manley, Ambassador Conado, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, please allow me to thank you for inviting IUCN to participate in today's important session. As most of you will know, IUCN is the world's largest and oldest global environmental organization. Our union brings together over 1,500 members across 170 countries. This includes over 200 states and government agency members and over 1,200 NGOs and indigenous peoples organizations. For example, both the UK and Italy are state members of IUCN, as are several of you in the room today, and we are honored to have you as our members. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently in the midst of a serious health and climate emergency. But there is another looming crisis facing us today, that of nature and biodiversity loss. As our members reminded us last month at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Marseille, which was kindly hosted by France, the nature and climate emergencies are not two separate crises. Rather, they are deeply interlinked faces of the same crisis. On the one hand, Climate change is today a major threat to the natural world. For example, IUCN has now identified climate change as the biggest threat to natural world heritage sites, 
the iconic treasures that we have on planet Earth. On the other hand, the loss and degradation of nature itself is a major driver of climate change. The land sector, for example, contributes to over 20% of total global emissions today. So what are the messages that we want to highlight for COP26? There are three messages that I would like to focus on today. These also emerged from the Marseille Manifesto that was adopted at our recent Congress. Number one, there is a big mismatch at the moment between what science is telling us is needed to limit warming to below 1.5 degrees centigrade and what countries are currently aiming for under their nationally determined contributions in support of the Paris Agreement. This was clearly shown, as Awaya mentioned, by the recent NDC synthesis done by the UNFCCC Secretariat. This calls for an urgent need for deep and sustained emission reductions by all countries across all sectors, which is also reflected then in more ambitious NDCs and long-term strategies. This is critical for addressing both the climate and biodiversity crisis and for achieving all the sustainable development goals that the world has agreed on. Number two, investing in nature-based solutions is a no-brainer for addressing the interlinked climate and biodiversity crisis. Based on the conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of the world's lands and ecosystems, nature-based solutions can provide around 30% of the total mitigation needed by 2030 to achieve the Paris Agreement temperature goal. At the same time, they can provide a range of other important benefits for adaptation, disaster risk reduction, job creation, food and water security, and poverty reduction. Mangroves alone, for example, provide over $65 billion in flood protection each year and safeguard 15 million people across the world against flooding while also sequestering carbon. Number three, nature-based solutions need more recognition and support at COP26. IUCN and its members and partners have been working on this topic for well over a decade now. There is a clear definition and global standard for nature-based solutions that has been endorsed by our membership. Thanks to all our collective efforts, there is growing recognition now of the importance and value of nature-based solutions. This was seen, for example, in the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit and in the Leaders' Pledge for Nature last year. This year, nature-based solutions also featured prominently in the Environment and Climate Ministerial communiques of the G7 and G20 summits which were chaired respectively by the UK and Italy. An increasing number of countries have also begun to explicitly incorporate nature-based solutions within their NDCs. At this juncture, I would like to thank the UK COP26 presidency and Italy in particular for making nature and nature-based solutions one of their thematic priorities for Glasgow. But what would be really useful at COP26 now is formal decision text that clearly recognizes and supports the enhanced implementation of nature-based solutions in line with the best international standards and guidance available. This would help to operationalize the decision text on nature that parties agreed to for the very first time at COP25 in Madrid and enable the unlocking of its full potential. Despite providing around 30% of the climate solution, nature-based solutions receive only around 3% of climate financing today. However, with everyone's support, we hope that we will be able to scale this up in the future. But, and this is my final point, nature-based solutions can deliver their magic only in the context of deeper decarbonization of the world economy, and that should not be forgotten. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Sandeep, and, and really um, pointing to the fact that it's decarbonization plus nature-based solution. That's, that's where the solution lies, and it's indeed a no-brainer. Let's invest in it. Let's not try to find in other 
complicated solutions how to uh, uh, get out of this crisis. Let's decarbonize and let's invest in nature-based solutions. But we need this together with the private sector. And uh, the private sector has an important role uh, to play, an incredibly important role to play. And uh, as a collective, uh, there's a call from the private sector on policymakers and negotiators at COP to set clear policy direction. Internally, the private sector is looking at, at carbon prices, at reforming the supply chains, at adopting uh, cleaner energy sources. And, and the question is always to them, are you doing enough? So joining us to, to provide insights on the progress of the business community on climate action and on the private sector role at COP26 is Maria Mendelucci, CEO of Women Business, a coalition uh, uh, that uh, co drives business action and advocacy on climate change. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Ambassadors. Thank you, Bruno, for inviting me to talk at this event. Uh, um, it's difficult to combine digital and physical, as we know, but I made everything possible to, to be in person here so that we start to go back to normal, right? And I have always been very loyal to, to the work uh, that this group, the Geneva Environmental Network, has been doing here in Geneva. So I used to work at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and in that capacity I've been often in these events. Now I lead this coalition which is focused on climate. It was created back in 2013, 2014 because at that time we thought, and I was at WBCSD at the other side, we thought that we needed to create a coalition that could bring the progressive business voice to the climate negotiations and one narrative. And since then I think we've been quite successful. Um, but let me tell you why. We think that if uh, the business sector raise their ambition and action on climate, then policymakers will have the confidence that they can have ambitious policies. And I have to say that I was very impressed this week when my colleagues sent me some data. And I want to congratulate the United Kingdom because it is extraordinary what has happened there. So women business focuses mainly in the UK, in Europe, and in US. And um, we have sent a letter to G20 countries, around 800 businesses. Okay, it is on our website. I'll tell you afterwards what we put in the letter. But um, of that letter, we had 165 signatories from the UK, 150 from the US, 13 from Italy, in total around 150 from, from, from Europe. We also have a campaign, it's called Business and Vision for 1.5. These are companies that are committed to be in net zero aligned with 1.5 scenarios, a thousand companies, of which 232 are from the UK, 155 from the US, 11 in, in, Euro, in Italy, and in Europe around 330. Why am I saying this? Because how funny it is that the most ambitious NDCs come from the UK, the US, and Europe. So I do think that our theory of change works. I think that the UK government and European go government have the confidence from many business leaders, big multinationals, that are saying, we are going to be 1.5. We want you to go governments to step up your game, scale up. So our mission is big, right? We will move to the G20 countries. Now, let me tell you what we tell companies as women business. We tell them that to be a climate leader, they need to do four things. The first thing, they need to commit to ambitious targets. And we have a very interesting initiative, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which we co-founded with other partners, which has around 2,000 companies that have committed to set science-based targets in the short term and in the long term. SBTI is coming with its guidance at COP on what it means to be net zero. Uh, business ambition is a subset of, of those companies that say we can be 1.5. As you know, at the beginning it was well below two and now everybody is behind the 1.5. Second, we also uh, are encouraging SMEs because we do believe that we should not leave anyone behind. We have a specific program, it's called the SME Climate Hub. We launched it last week in Spanish, as you know, I'm Spanish, so very happy that we speak other language than English. <laughs> and uh, we have 2,500 companies, SMEs, that have committed to be net zero and to have, uh, in fact, to be net zero, many of them by 2030. And so we are quite encouraged and we want to raise capacity building, etc. The second thing we tell companies, they need to act. Actually, it's not enough to have a vision, they need to act. And they need to collaborate and we help them through different initiatives. 
RB100, DB100, Mission Possible Partnerships, etc. You can see all this on our website. The third thing is that they need to be consistent in their advocacy. Okay? It doesn't work that they, they say that they're going to do something and they lobby something else. And the companies are under increasing scrutiny so that that consistency is there. And so I think companies are aware and they need to do a good mapping on where they are active. And if they are not aligned with what the trade association is doing, either they change those views or they leave that organization. And this is happening. And lastly, it's accountability. So they need to report progress. We support mandatory disclosures. We support them reporting progress. Because I think once you measure, once you have targets, we know that companies outperform those targets. And it's good that their peers and competitors see that. So we have a clear framework for companies' leadership. Of course, we're working with 2,000 leading companies, and there are millions of companies out there. So help us spread the word. For a COP26, we have very similar asks to policymakers uh, that what we have heard before. Let's keep 1.5 alive. Let's face out coal. Let's fix Article 6. Because I'm... Uh, 200% supporter of nature-based solution, or I call them nature climate solutions. At the moment, the only way, you know, for those, for companies to invest on nature, I think it is through um, their um, their um, net zero targets. Uh, of course, it is first decarbonization and additional. Let's invest in nature. Article 6 will help many companies invest uh, and make that fungible assets. And so, anyway, it would be fantastic for business. And lastly, the 100 billion. Yes, I think countries need to honor their commitments and provide what they promised a while ago already. So, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, and, and we see that the business is mobilizing and having these platforms like Women in Business is extremely important to, to get at the power of uh, the business world to adhere to this very high ambition uh, that we want to see at COP26. Now, mitigating and adapting to climate change while at the same time realizing the sustainable development goals by 2030, which is the agenda that we have as well, uh, means that you need to mobilize a lot of political and financial capital. And, and uh, uh, the capital that is there is is uh, also uh, ready to uh, enter into uh, a green transformation and financing this green transformation by aligning the investments and finance decision with a criteria that are aligned with environmental, social, and uh, uh, governance uh, uh, criteria. So to do this, uh, Eric Asche uh, uh, is with us to explain what the UN Environment Programme. Uh, on fi uh, finance initiative, sorry, uh, is doing with the banking and finance sector uh, to define these criteria and get them uh, implemented. Uh, Eric, over to you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, excellencies and um, uh, noted participants. Um, I think um, you know going into COP um, absolutely has been mentioned. Uh, the the public finance commitment of the hundred billion is critical and um, uh, is a very important um, piece of the puzzle which needs to be met um, uh, both in terms of financing needs and I think in terms of, of global equity. Um, however, we also have to keep in mind that um, you know, estimates are um, that we need in the order of about $4 trillion U.S. per year just for mitigation actions going forward. And so that's 40 times the $100 billion. So it points to the fact that that $100 billion is needed, and it's, it also needs to be catalytic in terms of mobilizing the private sector. Most of that investment is going to have to happen um, uh, in developing countries, so the, the large proportion of it. And this does not include um, uh, financing for adaptation and resilience. So the, the challenge is... Uh, uh, massive. Um, now, the private finance community has made recent calls for increases in public finance and um, also for increased uh, government ambition um, overall. Um, however, it's easy to ask others to do things. The question is, I think, what have they been doing? And uh, I'll break down my comments in the areas of transparency and ambition. Um, in terms of transparency, um, in 2015 at COP21, um, a program called the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, it's long-term, long the TCFD, 
um, was established to, to basically define how the private sector should start being transparent in terms of disclosing on climate risks. Um, they delivered a set of recommendations um, in 2017, and since then there has been quite significant uptake. Most large corporates today do disclose on climate risk. That's good. Um, so we have a good breadth of disclosures, mostly voluntary. However, the depth is not sufficient in terms of the quality of disclosures. And this is where the, the, the public sector has come in and started to move towards mandatory disclosures. We believe this is the way it should happen. The private sector should voluntarily lead in. And if it's not enough, then the, pri the public sector should start to, to mandate and regulate. Uh, the European Central Bank, the, the Bank of England, the Bank of J uh, Japan, um, and, and others are starting to integrate it into how they function and they're including supervisory functions for actors in the financial sector in terms of uh, increasing the quality of such disclosures. Um, we have to understand that, um, for instance, take banks, very large organizations typically, they, they manage risks, that's a big part of their responsibility, but managing climate risk is a very complicated task. You can no longer look at what failed in the past, you need to be predictive of the future, and so you need to do scenario analysis, stress testing, and the like. So it is a big change, but they are, are making um, a lot of progress there. Um, now, of course, just being transparent doesn't necessarily move the capital to the places it needs to go. So my second topic is then on ambition. Um, we in the United Nations Environment Program, we have been convening um, uh, a number of the large net zero alliances which have sprung up um, under the umbrella of the uh, Glasgow Financial Alliances for Net Zero. Um, and um, the first one was launched in 2019 at the UN summit um, uh, in September, a group of asset owners. So these are insurers and pension funds who made a commitment to net zero by 2050. Since then, we have um, groups of insurers, of banks, and others in the, in the financial sector, um, a, a lot uh, running alongside or in parallel to what is going on elsewhere in, in the private sector. Um, if I can talk about banks, banks are intimately integrated into the economy. They finance everything, and particularly in the developing world, most financing comes via the banks. Therefore, decarbonizing banks is very much akin to decarbonizing the economy. The, the Net Zero Banking Alliance um, today, it's, it just started in April at the Biden summit where it was launched, announced. Today, it's already grown uh, to 76, mostly very large banks, and it's more will be announced shortly. It's already over a third of the global banking industry in terms of fund financing that they manage, which have committed to uh, this net zero target. Um, now, of course, saying things for 2050, as we know, it doesn't mean that much. Really, what's credible is the interim targets. Uh, they are issued, uh, focused on issuing interim 2030 targets and the requirements, and you can find the information online. It's very specific what they need to do. It's somewhat uh, maybe akin to the Paris Handbook in terms of for governments. Um, they need to align with scientific-based scenarios, be they IPCC, IEA or others. They need to rely on low, um, no or low overshoot trajectory. So on IPCC, this is the P1 to P3 scenarios, if you know these. So there's no thought that we're going to wait and find a dream solution in the 2040s that's going to solve our problems. We need to actually align today with the reductions that are required. Um, only minimum um, reliance on carbon offsets, really only for the sectors where it's very hard to abate. Um, I take the example of, of aviation, where the feeling is maybe it's not possible to get completely to net zero, so um, offsets might be needed there to some element, but this should not be the main tool. It should really be about how do we decarbonize um, different sectors. Um, over the next 12 months, most of these banks, the ones who have uh, joined um, early on, will issue their interim targets for all major emitting sectors for 2030. Um, and I think who these banks are is interesting. It is the 10 largest banks in Europe, the nine largest banks in North America, and others, but it includes all the largest ones, seven out of the 10 largest in Latin America. I think it's three out of 10 in Asia um, and more, but it also includes quite a number of developing country banks, the largest bank in Kenya, in Egypt, in Morocco, uh, sorry, in Mexico, in Brazil, and more. So these are the big banks. They finance the economy and they've set their eyes on net zero and what they need to get there. Now, of course, um, it's one thing about setting commitments and another one about being accountable and following through. 
Um, the group of investors I mentioned, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, who are the first, who've been running for two years, they, they issued their progress report yesterday. You can find it online where they have the similar requirements, but they're already implementing. And they actually, because they've had two years to work on it, they've now issued their 2025 targets, which are aligned with the science, which basically, according to IPCC, means reducing across portfolio 16 to 29 percent. And um, they, 29 um, of these investors who make up $4 trillion in the economy is quite significant. Um, they are all within that. Most of them are at the upper end of that band, band between 25 and 30 percent um, down in the next four years. Um, they've also issued statements around the coal phase out, the use of carbon offsets. They've also pushed the IEA um, towards releasing a net zero scenario, and we're very happy that that's what happened last week uh, in the WIO, and there's a very good... Um, press conference from Fatih Birol, who heads the International Energy Agency, talking about the need to essentially stop financing all fossil fuel development uh, now. Um, so things are happening. I think these are sending important signals from, from across the, the spectrum, both in developed and developing countries. Last comment, policy signals are critically important, and I do want to congratulate um, the presidency uh, uh, Italy for the presidency of the G G20. It's a very important, um, there was a sustainable finance study group. Um, it went into um, deep freeze, I can say, for a couple of years. And the Italian presidency um, reestablished this study group, elevated it into a working group, and just recently have issued a five-year roadmap for what the sustainable finance working group is going to work on in the coming years. It's very ambitious, and I think um, this is what the financial sector really looks to, the signals that they need to actually start to implement, and hopefully we see that happening, and um, COP26 will, will build that momentum. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eric. And, and once again, a very high level of ambition. That's really, uh, again, what you underline. But also the, 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 these notions of of transparency, of disclosure, and of accountability. And uh, on accountability, of course, it brings us to uh, uh, the idea that climate change is also a question of, of, of justice and, uh, and, and of uh, equity. And let me also remind uh, uh, the audience that just two weeks ago, a resolution on healthy, uh, the right to healthy environment was adopted here in Geneva, a, a, a breakthrough, really, uh, that had been called uh, upon by civil society for years and years. And, and the voice of civil society in getting us accountable, getting us uh, uh, ready to transform and to be part of uh, uh, the transformation is uh, what also is driving the ambition at COP26. And to talk about this today, we are joined by uh, Joy uh, Chaudhuri of the International Network for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that represents over 280 social movements, NGOs, and advocates across 75 countries. They work with their members to advance and advocate for fundamental human rights. And uh, Joy, I would like to give you the floor uh, to, give you, uh, to give your perspective on, on the key expectations for COP26 from a civil society perspective. Over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. We very much welcome this dialogue today and this opportunity to speak to some of the expectations and demands for COP26 from a civil society perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are heading into COP26 in a world where we are seeing on one hand devastating and escalating climate impacts leading to severe human rights harm, particularly affecting the most vulnerable and marginalized amidst intersecting crises, including the COVID-19 pandemic, and ongoing vaccine inequity. And on the other hand, despite the clear need for deep emission cuts, as Valerie mentioned, there is the recent UNFCCC NDC synthesis report, which warns us that we are way off track in reducing emissions, which are in fact set to rise. The latest production gap report, which emphasizes that fossil fuel production plans are dangerously out of sync with Paris. And according to new research, the fossil fuel industry is benefiting from subsidies of $11 million every minute. Much needed climate finance is not being delivered as per commitments. And we have the reality that environmental human rights defenders, often on the front line of experiencing climate impacts, 
resisting structural drivers of the climate crisis, whose incredible work has been documented to concretely reduce emissions, who work tirelessly for people and the planet, they are under unprecedented attack, many murdered. These are gaps that need to close urgently for the goals of Paris to be met. In terms of some key expectations and demands for COP26 from a civil society perspective, we agree with many across constituencies that without the fulfillment of human rights domestically and extraterritorially, we cannot advance effective climate action. The commitment to human rights is embedded in the Paris Agreement and must be central in all aspects of decisions taken at COP26. Effectively and urgently addressing loss and damage is a human rights and climate justice imperative. The lack of commitment of parties so far to address at sufficient scale the impacts and injustices of loss and damage is causing immense human suffering. At COP26, it is vital that parties, with developed parties taking proportionate action, deliver on loss and damage at the scale required and in ways that urgently provide tangible support to meet the needs of vulnerable people and communities hardest hit by unavoidable climate impacts. This includes the provision of new and additional finance for loss and damage. Parties must also meet, of course, as it mentioned, the existing climate finance commitments. We also expect the full and rights compliant operationalization of the Santiago network. The mitigation gap continues to be a concern from a human rights perspective. Parties, especially G20 countries, must submit new or updated human rights consistent NDCs with 2030 targets, which are aligned with the 1.5 imperative and account for a just and equitable transition. We also call on parties to ensure human rights in Article 6. We have seen previous market-based mechanisms developed under the UNFCCC fail to deliver emission reductions, lead to violations of human rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, in particular in relation to land rights. And overall, such mechanisms create a commitment environment for big polluters to delay and distract from actually reducing their own emissions. Parties must provide for rules that prohibits the inherent faults of market instruments observed so far. And just to underline, it is critically important to ensure that all Article 6 activities respect, promote, and consider human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples, including through the integration of rights-based social and environmental safeguards. These elements must not be overlooked in the rush to adopt rules. Without them, there is a very real risk of undermining Paris altogether. Just a last word on nature-based solutions, since this came up frequently and has great relevance for the upcoming COP26. Of course, nature-based solutions are important, but civil society is also concerned that it remains somewhat ill-defined, which can lead to co-optation. And it's worth noting that some of its most vocal supporters include industries and governments responsible for much of the historical and ongoing damage to the planet and communities worldwide. Without clarity and without safeguards, it can lead to human rights violations, including forced evictions from lands and territories. So we call for ecosystem-based approaches full compliance with human rights, including the rights of indigenous peoples, and underline that while such solutions are important, they must not allow big polluters to simply offset continuing emissions. In closing, we expect parties to act now for present and future generations, to advance real solutions, to respect the fundamental promise of Paris to uphold human rights and equity. Make COP26 count. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Joy, and, 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 and really uh, it is a question of social justice and of human rights and definitely as well as I said earlier, and you mentioned that as well, we've got a role to play here in Geneva, in this very international city of Geneva, where these questions are transversely uh, coming and are looked now through the climate change angle, and that's so important. now. All through the presentation, there's been a call for high ambition, but also a call for action. And action is happening as we talk. And uh, earlier this week, the Earthshot Prize uh, was announced uh, in, in, in very nice ceremony uh, on the BBC. Uh, the Royal Foundation 
of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge launched the prize in 2020 uh, to search for inspiring and innovating solutions to problems facing the planet. The prize is inspired by the call uh, by President Kennedy uh, on the Moonsho Moonshot uh, program that uh, uh, launched uh, the idea that the man would be on the moon uh, uh, in the next decade. And uh, this challenge at the time was seen as incredible, impossible to, to uh, achieve, but humankind made it. And in the same spirit, uh, the royal household is uh, coming with the Earthshot Prize that uh, it is feasible if we uh, find the right solutions uh, that uh, are inspiring and innovative and uh, really tackle the issues that we are facing. So I'm really pleased to welcome one of the winners of the Earthshot Prize, uh, a winner in the category Fix Up Climate, uh, Mrs. Valtea Cohen, who heads an EPTE, a company that produces the first scalable electrolyzer to replace fossil fuels with green hydrogen. This is a prize for the most outstanding effort to battle the climate crisis. Uh, Mrs. Cohen, over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Bruno, distinguished guests and fellow uh, panelists. It's an honor to join you today as one of the winners of the Earthshot Prize. Um, so I actually come from an island. I'm born in New Caledonia, so I have a very personal connection to climate change since my family is uh, is threatened right by the sea level rise, as we've, as we've already um, heard of earlier today. But um, adopting clean solutions can just happen out of idealism. They must become the most economically attractive solution. And this is what we will do as an after by making the most cost-effective electrolyzer. An after designs and manufactures the AEM electrolyzer. So in our next slide, we paint the picture on why do we need green hydrogen in the first place? Well, it's because it's an alternative fuel that can end our reliance uh, on fossil fuels in sectors like mobility, heating and cooling, um, and as well as uh, industries. Because today, 20% of our global energy consumption is met by electricity. And so renewables such as solar and wind are doing a great job at driving down the cost of green electricity. We can drive the cost uh, down of green hydrogen thanks to our core technology, which I'm happy to tell you more about in our next slide. Our secret sauce is the anion exchange membrane technology, which is the patent that we hold. And it's a game changer because it doesn't rely on any rare metals to achieve high performance. It is also made to work with renewables. So it's adapting to variability without any problems. We are combining the best of the available technologies out there, which means high performance with low cost. So we have a unique technology, but we also have a unique approach that I'd like to uh, walk you through in our next slide. When we look at economic history, what has seen the most rapid cost reduction? It is through mass produced commodities. If we take, for example, um, the IT industry, the first computers were the mainframes, which we can see in the 1980s, which were then completely replaced by the portable computer, which is a product. And nowadays, blade servers are mass produced and standardized compact products, which are scaling computing capacities to even lower prices. We can say the same about solar panels. They're replacing centralized cold fired power plants by being a mass produced a commodity that is now even making renewables cheaper than fossil fuels. We believe that now it's the time for green hydrogen. In our next slide, we can see how, uh, how this analogy applies to green hydrogen with the AM electrolyzer. So other electrolyzer manufacturers today are building systems similar to the IT industry's early mainframe. Each of them are developed as a project and these are requiring not only sophisticated engineering and planning, but essentially they're difficult to scale. At Anapture, we're mimicking the introduction of a PC, uh, a product that is standardized, compact, and modular, and also cost-effective. In our next slide, we can walk you through what exactly we are mass producing and how we are reaching those low costs. So the core stack that you can see is our core AEM stack 
which is what we are um, standardizing and mass producing. So one of these core stacks will be um, integrated in our kilowatt standardized electrolyzer, which is the small box to uh, the left hand side. And it is the same core stack that we are using to reach the megawatt scale electrolyzer, which is our containerized solution, which holds 420 um, core AEM stacks. And we believe that by mass producing this core stack, we can drive down the cost of green hydrogen uh, to compete with fossil fuels by the mid of the decade. So if you ask us now, where are the electrolyzers uh, running today? In our next slide, we can look at a handful of our use cases. And before sharing some example, it's critical to understand that Anapter is a technology provider. We are focusing all of our time and effort in scaling up the production of our AEM electrolyzers, and we are working with uh, system integrators, energy developers, um, independent power providers, uh, and various energy players that will take the electrolyzers and integrate it for end users and, and customers. So as you can see here on um, these images, we are, um, uh, our electrolyzers are generating green hydrogen across uh, all sectors. Our customers are, for example, using them to refuel cars, but also planes, drones, snowmobiles. So the mobility uh, sector is one that is uh, growing at the moment in using our uh, electrolyzers and also in the green hydrogen sector at large. Our electrolyzers are also used in combination with uh, solar panels and direct air capture technology. In this um, image at sunrise in Australia, our partners have combined uh, hydrogen with uh, carbon dioxide to create green methane. So our electrolyzers can also be used uh, to create synthetic fuels, whether it is green ammonia or green methane. Hydrogen is also uh, fantastic for long-term storage um, of energy. So for example, in the top right corner, you see an image of um, our electrolyzers used here to provide seasonal storage where uh, snow is covering the solar panels. Um, in the bottom right, we can also see an image of one application where eight of our electrolyzers are generating green, uh, green hydrogen that is injected into the natural gas infrastructure to provide heat to nearby apartments in um, via a hydrogen boiler. And in the next slide, I'd like to really stress that the use cases for green hydrogen are, are endless. The ones that were just shared are the ones that we're seeing today, but there are also even more uh, of them coming out. For example, um, hydrogen here is used uh, to create an alternative protein, which we didn't even know was, was possible, but our customers are using our electrolyzers to do so. So by making a modular and easy to use system, we are working towards making green hydrogen accessible for all and putting the solution in the hands of users so that they can replace fossil fuels. In the next slide, I'd like to just show you um, our current operations here in Pisa. So we can see here the expansion uh, in regards to our uh, serial fabrication, which is where our electrolyzers are being built today. And in the next slide, you can see our next step which is the scale up of our AM electrolyzers in our mass production site in Zabek, which is in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. So we have started the construction of our Nupture campus uh, uh, yeah, uh, five weeks ago. And as you can notice, it will be fully powered by renewables because we believe there doesn't need to be an environmental trade-off between scaling up and, um, and, and, uh, and the environment. So this is where we will be producing um, 10,000 units per month beginning of 2023, and the Earthshot Prize will support us in doing so. And in our last slide, I'd like to show um, this, this pretty clear um, graphic where you can see that the supply chain has significantly changed in regards to, to energy. We no longer need to be emitting CO2 and, and creating a lot of waste by extracting fossil fuels, but rather rely on renewable energies. So solar and wind have disrupted the way we generate power, and these new energies are locally available. So distributed renewables work differently than these large centralized power plants that we knew from before. And in order to accommodate for this development, we need modular electrolyzers to flexibly produce hydrogen on site whenever solar and wind are available. The time is now, and the window is still open. So we need to phase out fossil fuels and commit to green hydrogen as one of the solutions. Thank you.
thanks a lot uh, uh, for uh, this energi energizing presentation, if I can say, but really for bringing as well uh, the, this disruptive thinking and disruptive action which is needed for transformation. And I think, as a summary, that's what we've, we've heard throughout. Uh, the, the ambition is driven by this need for transformation, and we can mobilize. We can really achieve uh, the ambition by mobilizing uh, uh, everyone in society, from governments to private sector to banking to civil society, in no respective order. It's, it's all together that we will uh, make it happen. And uh, uh, the, 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 the example brought by the Earthshot Prize is, is uh, also a driver of, of hope and of feeling that, yes, we can, we can do it, we can achieve it. What we've achieved as well is to finish um, before time, which is absolutely wonderful. So it gives us the opportunity to open the floor, I think, for about 10 minutes uh, uh, for, for quests. Uh, no, even more than that. Oh, wonderful. For about half an hour then uh, for uh, uh, questions and answers. So I'll first turn to the room uh, because it's just easier for me. But I know we are collecting questions on our web pages. And I see uh, I, you can turn your microphone. If you could introduce yourself and say if there's a speaker to which you would like to address your question to. Right. Uh, congratulations to all the speakers for your excellent insights. Um, Sartha Groy, and uh, my question is uh, directed to Ambassador Manley and the representative from UNEP. So in July, uh, at the Venice conference of G20 foreign ministers and uh, central bank governors, it was observed that despite the growth of international agreements over the last uh, 30 years, the rate of decarbonization has remained unchanged. And I, I was just wondering, how can COP26 going forward change this uh, very dangerous statistics? And what could be the reasons? Because I feel, is it because of a lack of uh, market incentive to decarbonize? Or are countries just free riding where they depend on other countries to act before acting on themselves? Thank you so much. I think we, if you agree, uh, 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 panelists, we're going to take two or three questions and then and then uh, uh, try to answer them. I've got, uh, I see Atli from the Disaster Dipl Displacement uh, Platform, where I saw him. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for this great event, and it's very good to be together in person. I work for something called the Platform on Disaster Displacement, which deals with displacement and loss and damage related to the adverse effect of climate change. It's state-led and currently under the chairmanship of Fiji and France. And, and we, um, I may have a question to Ambassador Coronado and Ambassador Manley. Loss and damage is important. And um, we heard from um, the, the Deputy Ex Executive Secretary that there was certain unfinished business from the last COP. And, and on loss and damage, one unfinished business was around the governance of loss and damage under the UNFCCC, and also, as, as Joy mentioned, the Santiago Network on loss and damage. And I just want you to maybe give us an update. How do you see the issue of loss and damage being uh, tabled and negotiated at the COP? And how can we support you to have a good decision on loss and damage and to drive that agenda forward? So thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. My name is Sebastian Dirk from the Center for International Environmental Law, and I'm very glad to hear, actually, in the last intervention, the reference to loss and damage. I will add also, how do we leverage uh, finance for loss and damage? Because that's really the elephant in the room. My question actually relates to the other 80% of emissions that have not been addressed as explicitly as the, those resulting from the land sector. We know that those results from our inability to limit and eliminate our dependency on fossil fuels. And so uh, my question will relate to this and actually will also build on the fact that this year we have not seen only this very important report published by the IPCC, but also finally a very significant report published by the International Energy Agency in relation to the need actually to really, for all governments to tackle our dependency on fossil fuels uh, head on. And so um, in that context, civil society welcomes uh, the alliance Beyond oil and gas, the, sorry, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, 
But we also believe it's time for the COP actually to really name explicitly this issue. As we all know, we cannot solve a problem that we do not name. And so my question would be to the panelists, but in particular to the, the COP presidency is, can we actually expect this year to have COP26 recognize explicitly the challenge that we face in relation to fossil fuels and to name those as the problem that we need to focus on? Can we preserve, at the light of a recent report from the International Energy, Energy Agency, the credibility of this process under the Paris Agreement? Because otherwise, unfortunately, we fear that um, we really see that there is a growing discrepancy between this process and actually the increasing messages from the scientific community and, of course, all of unified civil society voices. Thank you. So, thanks a lot. Uh, I, ambassadors, if you allow, uh, I would, with your permission, maybe turn first to uh, Ovais, who is still online with us for a few minutes, to see if he has some reactions on these uh, questions, and notably on, on the loss and damage uh, from, from the UNFCCC perspective. Uh, Ovais, do you, are you happy with this? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Bruno, and I greatly appreciate it. Unfortunately, I have to leave in a few minutes. And uh, again, thank you uh, for organizing this and, and for all the uh, statements and uh, perspectives shared and the questions also. Uh, so greatly appreciate it. I'll be very brief on, uh, reflect on just very quickly on the loss and damage in Santiago Network. Uh, yeah, that is something that is one of the unfinished business, as I said, as I characterized it. And it is high on the agenda and uh, what needs to happen and how the PDD can help is to uh, provide very clear messages in terms of what are your expectations to through the <clears throat> presidency or pres uh, negotiators uh, who are focusing on that. That is the Warsaw International Mechanism under the chairmanship, as you already said, uh, of France and Fiji. Uh, so we really need to, the governance of loss and damage is indeed uh, something that needs to be concluded. And as you know, in the climate negotiations, it's not the only uh, decisions. The, these are, there are interlinkages with finance, with the carbon markets, with the transparency uh, and, and reporting formats and so on. So. It is very high on the agenda. We are very much aware of it, and our secretariat is working very closely with the key negotiators on the loss and damage, and our colleagues in the adaptation unit are fully aware of uh, the uh, importance of it. And I expect, I'm cautiously optimistic, that in the package of decisions that will be uh, taken at the top uh, in the final days will include uh, the loss and damage. Back to you, Bruno. Thanks a lot, and, and really thanks for uh, uh, your presence, as you might have to leave in a few minutes uh, of AIS as well. So maybe now I'll, I'll turn to the, the, the two presidencies, and, and we've got these questions, but also you, you had in your remarks, Ambassador uh, Manley, uh, uh, ideas about bringing uh, uh, the, the, the post-COP to Geneva, so maybe you want to comment on this, and then I'll turn to Ambassador Coronado to also uh, uh, give answers uh, to the questions, but also maybe underline what, what, and it has been mentioned, what the work of Italy in the G20 has been uh, in, in uh, the work on climate. Over to you. Um, thank you. I mean, I mean, first of all, let, let me just say, I've been really um, enthused by this uh, discussion uh, here. Uh, enthused, I think, by that sense of being informed by the science, and kind of, you know, thanks to uh, Valerie and on that. Enabled by the tech, uh, and I thought, you know, uh, uh presentation was just so sort of motivating. Uh, and, um, but also by that sense of collaboration and ambition we've heard, the collaboration with business, uh, the collaboration with civil society uh, and that sense of ambition. And you know, to answer your question about Geneva, because I think what we've also seen this morning is kind of why Geneva. I mean, in, in all our, in all the uh, interventions this morning, I mean, it, this is a this is an economic issue, as our friends from business have said. It's a trade issue. 
uh, it's a human rights issue, as Joey rightly said, and as we saw in the Human Rights Council just a few days ago, it's a humanitarian issue. And in all those, in all those prisms are present here in Geneva, and, and therefore we need uh, to work on them in the days going up to COP26, but actually I think in particular uh, following what we hope will be a successful uh, conference uh, in uh, Glasgow. And I mean, on the, the particular points we raised, look, uh, I think I said at the start, I mean, coal, which is sort of a, it's a, sh a shorthand for decarbonisation, it's absolutely at the heart of uh, what we've been trying to do as G7 presidency uh, over the course of this year, and it's absolutely at the heart of what we um, hope to achieve uh, in uh, Glasgow. Um, uh, we know what we need to do in terms of uh, enabling the transition, and, and Maria has kind of set out, uh, and Barry as well, kind of uh, how we can do this. You know, we have we have the tech to do this. Uh, we can uh, transform the way that we generate our power, the way that we heat our homes, the way we power uh, our mobility. Um, so we just need uh, to do it, um, and we've tried to do our bit, as you'll know, by sort of restricting the uh, financing of uh, coal-fired coal -fired power stations uh, overseas as well. Um, on damage and loss, look, uh, clearly uh, a big issue. It was a big issue in Madrid, if I remember rightly. Uh, and uh, we said uh, in Madrid that uh, you know, it highlighted that kind of the existing uh, sources of funds from uh, under and outside the convention were being applied to this issue, that, but, but one needs to be done. Um, uh, and we've been taking that forward, as many of you will know, with, with Chile. Um, uh, we've set in motion a process of consultations to develop uh, what we know as the Santiago Network uh, for loss and damage uh, and to understand what further action can be agreed at COP26 uh, in a few days' time to further uh, enhance the work uh, in this uh, area. I think just, kind of my, just my last point would be, um, and we've heard a lot uh, this morning about... Uh, the need to be inclusive and the need to be collaborative. And we absolutely um, hear that. I mean, the, you know, this, we want to see a comprehensive uh, agreement uh, in Glasgow. We want to see an ambitious agreement. We want to see a balanced agreement. Uh, uh, and we, need, we know that to get there, we need to be collaborative and inclusive uh, in the way that we run this process. Uh, and that no issue can be left behind and no one can be left behind if we were to make a success uh, of this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I fully share your point of view. It's a, it's a major challenge. It's a challenge for our planet. It's a challenge for our life and for the lives of our children and the next generation. We have to work in order to grant the best success of the Glasgow Conference because we need to make the difference, we must make the difference. And we need, uh, first of all, the leadership of the young leaders, the young people. It is their planet we are talking about. They will inherit it. And we have to, and, and we need to have the involvement of the entire international community. Uh, there's no, no country can lead this process and make it successful alone. And we don't have, to leave anyone behind. So we need to support the poorest countries of the world. This is why it's so important to keep the commitment to mobilize the US, uh, the $100 billion by 2025 in favor of developing countries. This is uh, important. This is essential to uh, help them to uh, proceed and to fight the and address the challenge of uh, climate change. It is in this, this funds must be increased, accessible, and, predicted, and predictable, because we, we, we cannot leave part of the world behind. And of course, when we are talking about loss and damage, we're talking about the countries more directly affected by climate change. I visit the South Pacific area. I visit the Marshall Islands. I know what it does mean to live in a land which is only one meter tall. And when major storms occur, waves go from one side to the other of the island. Think of, the, think of people they can feel when they see the land completely covered by the waters. So 
And uh, I also visit Kiribati. And I know the Kiribati is losing lands and islands. And in many of uh, at the islands of Kiribati, they cannot they cannot live any longer because there's no long no more water, or all water has been uh, affected by the salted marine water. So it is a real issue. This is a real problem. We can which can provoke my, uh, migrations. People forced to leave their lands because of climate change. So it is a major issue we are all aware of, and the international community is fully committed to, to address it. And we, we have to make an effort to, um, to support those countries and the countries most affected by loss and damage, because so far uh, the uh, mitigation action has been insufficient. It is very clear. We see this by the result. But we, we are aware of that. The leaders of the world are aware of that. They want to work together. This is why Glasgow is an historic event. Uh, and this is why I was saying that it was the most important event of the year. Because the challenge is enormous. But we can make it all together. It's a joint global planetary effort we have to promote. Um, but we have to believe in ourselves. This is the most important uh, challenge we have in our life, but we have to believe in ourselves because we have, if we don't trust uh, on ourselves, who will trust us? It is extremely important to be to make a joint common global efforts in view of Glasgow to make the conference a success. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. Uh, I, I... There's a lot of questions online, and, and we won't be able to address them all, I'm afraid. But I'm, I'm picking two, and, and sorry, that I'm, I've got to make choices. But there's, there's one coming from uh, Neil uh, McCullough to all panelists and, and, uh, we, about, about the issue of fossil fuel subsidies and how uh, this uh, can be uh, tackled in commitments at the COP, at the G7, at the G20, how to address that as well uh, 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 to redirect these subsidies to other sectors uh, and, and that's probably also addressed then to our uh, uh, colleagues who have addressed who have spoken on finance and then there's a question on uh, uh, the future creating companies like Enepte and their, di their disruptive innovation in policy and economics uh, how can we create a level playing field by including, for example, externalities of greenhouse uh, gases, which would give these new companies the boost uh, that is needed uh, for the world. So that is uh, about incentives, I would say, uh, uh, both in policy and finance. So I, I don't know if I, maybe I'll turn to Maria first. And Thank you. So in terms of fossil fuel subsidies, um, we think that this need to be avoided. It's just nonsense, right? We need to price externalities, <laughs> not give them subsidies, right? So it's just like nonsense. So, I mean, how to do it? I think it is about co countries committing to do it. The private sector cannot do it. I in terms of the, the question around um, hydrogen, it's a super, like, congratulations. I love the project. And I think the current uh, high energy prices, together with the high carbon prices, provide an incentive for these technologies to, to scale. I think in addition to the Earthshot um, price, I think uh, commitments from companies to buy those electrolyzers is what will help them um, scale. Um, and um, yeah, the, um, the future is there, is, is green hydrogen. I couldn't agree more. I, I love the, the decentralized nature of the project, but I also think that we need to invest in high in grid infrastructure uh, um, and infrastructure to also yeah, bring the renewable offshore wind, for example, in the UK to, to, the, to the places where that hydrogen can be, um, can be man uh, created. And it is an energy storage solution that is, is needed for our future. And it will av avoid so much volatility and political pressure. So yeah, I think definitely we all need to work in that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So I think, Vaitea, are you still online with us? Uh, as, as you are facing probably some of these issues, the policy framework, 
uh, uh, getting the finance right and so on. What is your experience and what would be your recommendations? I would uh, definitely start by recommending to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. I think this is the, the, the biggest thing that needs to change because we cannot compete when the playing field is not levelized. So it's impossible for us to, to compete with artificially low prices from fossil fuels. So our technology will not require any um, subsidies or, or any external support. We know that our core technology will drive down the cost on its own, but there are still many things that we are not controlling. And so while we are focusing on a low capex, low cost of the electrolyzer, if the cost of electricity is still high, then the cost of hydrogen will also be high. So while we are driving down the cost of the electrolyzer itself, it is in the hands of policymakers to lower the cost of electricity. Thank you. Indeed, thanks a lot. And, and it is also for the uh, finance sector to mobilize Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we've heard reference to the, the production gap report that's just come out in recent days, pointing out the obvious inconsistency between NDCs and the fact that governments still have production plans that are double um, what would allow us to stay within the 1.5 trajectory. So there's an inconsistency there. If you look at the financial sector, you know, there, I think there has been rightfully continues to be a lot of criticism of different financial actors, particularly the big banks. You need to parse the data a little bit. And actually, if you look at what form of financing is happening in the financial sector, the banks have actually stopped. <clears throat> They've curtailed their lending significantly to these sectors. They realize it's a bad bet. It doesn't make sense. However, what the uh, banks still do do is they help in the capital markets. So they help companies raise money where the banks don't actually have the risk. Someone else is buying the bond or the stock in the capital markets. And there they have not yet curtailed um, their facilitation. Part of the reason is because it's still legal. It's very remunerative. And, um, you know, someone is buying that stuff. And so part of the case it would make is um, this is where, um, you know, as long as it's legal, to dig the stuff out of the ground, somebody's going to do it. And they will point out that, you know, we can't lead from the front if behind us there's someone who's very happy to make money on doing this. So I, I think it sort of a little bit points out the case that voluntary leadership from different parts of the private sector is very important to get things started. But unless you have the ex internalization of these costs so that it makes them non-economic, we, we, we can't wishfully think that these things won't get dug up. So it, it is a combined responsibility, I think, between public and private. But a lot of it has to do with the, the policy signals. Fossil fuel subsidies are the most um, obvious inconsistency that need to be addressed. Thanks a lot. Uh, I saw another question in, on the floor. Please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the briefing. It's, uh, it was very useful and interesting. So I'm speaking from the Geneva Cities Hub. We are a platform that helps cities and local and regional governments better engage with multilateral processes and, and bodies. Um, and so my question is directed at both state representative, I would imagine, like uh, both the ambassador of um, UK and Italy, but also uh, the representative from UNFCC, but I guess he's gone. So we heard that the conference uh, needs to be as inclusive and as collaborative as, as possible, and you mentioned it several times. And we want to promote that kind of inclusive multilateralism that uh, our, the Secretary General uh, Gutierrez has also mentioned in his common agenda. And for that purpose, you mentioned um, several times the youth, civil society, and mostly the private sector. But so my big question is, what about the cities? We know that um, cities are main emission hubs. Um, how can we best engage with mayors and municipal representatives? They will be very numerous in Glasgow. They are mobilizing. Uh, there will be city networks present. So how can we best you know, um, engage with that constituency, which is quite important and will be increasingly important as the world continues to, to urbanize. Thanks a lot. So we'll, we'll take these questions, but if, if, if I may as well, I will direct it as well to Sandeep. I know nature-based solution in cities is also a, a, a very big topic uh, that has been developing and is part of the solution. 
and and enjoy uh, after if you want to comment as well uh, eighty percent I think of the population of the world lives in an urban environment, so definitely uh, uh, there's an impact uh, uh, on 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 this dimension but but uh, as the questions were addressed to uh, ambassadors uh, over to you. <laughs> Um, just, just to take the last one, if I may. I mean, just so I agree. Uh, <laughs> think globally, act locally. Think, think cities. I mean, you know, um, uh, mayor of my own home city, uh, Sadi Khan, of course, is the uh, new chair of the uh, 40, C40 cities. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of this can be done at, uh, at a local level. And it's really important that, we, that communities take ownership uh, of the actions that are needed uh, to make this a reality in that collaborative way that I think we've all spoken about. I believe that the, the involvement must be global. The entire civil society must be involved. Uh, you think about cities, but we might also consider metropolitan areas, uh, uh, regions, uh, depending on the, uh, on the structure of the countries. Uh, uh, countries themselves, regional organizations, all these uh, uh, entities uh, are involved, are already involved in this process. Climate change is global. It, uh, it affects all of us. Uh, it can also be, uh, I would say, uh, arrondissement, like you say in, uh, uh, in Paris, uh, boroughs. So uh, I, I don't believe that in singling uh, simply the, the city itself might be uh, the solution, because uh, uh, you have metropolitan areas composed of many municipalities. So uh, it's, uh, it's a global issue to be discussed globally will with all entities. This is my perspective. Everyone should be inclusive, included because this is a very inclusive process. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bruno, and, and thank you for that question. Um, as the ambassadors have already pointed out, you know, in addressing the challenge of climate change, no actor can be left behind and, and, and everybody has to play their part. And in that context, cities have a critical role to play in addressing the climate challenge as well. Uh, as, as you all know, I mean, cities are a major source of emissions. They are major sources of population centers in, in the world. And therefore, you can't actually imagine uh, a, a, a robust response to climate change that doesn't take into account the, the role of cities and subnational governments. And in that context, one of the decisions that was adopted by our members in, in, in the last IUCN Congress in, in Marseille last month was actually to create a new category of IUCN membership that focused on subnational governments and, and, and cities, uh, which, which actually even goes to broaden even further the, the breadth of, of the constituencies that we engage with. And Bruno already mentioned in the context of nature-based solutions, there is increasing awareness and action even within cities uh, themselves, within regional governments, within municipalities, of the important contribution that nature-based solutions can make in improving urban resilience, climate resilience in the urban sector, in reducing heat island defects, for example, in ensuring flood protection and water drainage. And, you know, and so one of the things that we have also recently done is, is launch an urban nature index to actually help monitor how much cities are incorporating nature-based solutions um, within their own jurisdictions. And we very much look forward to supporting this work further as we go ahead. Thank you. And Joy, if you want to, if you want to comment, and then um, I'll close. Sure, very briefly. Absolutely, I think um, cities, including urban areas, are very, very central to climate action at COP26 and beyond. Just to mention one small aspect in loss and damage, because it's an issue that we work a lot on, we see huge amounts of displacement, internal displacement, um, you know, what is called climate-forced uh, migration, and um, the flows to cities that are happening are just massive in numbers. The infrastructure is not equipped, uh, the rights infrastructure as well, so absolutely, very much because they are being affected, they need to be part of that conversation. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot uh, for these uh, answers. And, and uh, ambassadors, colleagues, and dear friends, uh, really we've come now to the, the closing of, of this event. I think the richness of the interventions, but also from, of the questions from the floor, 
demonstrate that uh, uh, there is a, a willingness in Geneva to see uh, COP26 succeed, to bring the results of uh, COP26 to the debates here in Geneva so that uh, the whole system mobilizes around the outcomes and, and that we transform this uh, ambition into action. I want to thank uh, uh, the UK Mission for uh, 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 reaching out to the, Gen and the Geneva Environment Network uh, for hosting uh, this event today and for organizing this uh, uh, gathering. Uh, there's a recording of it that you can find online uh, on the Geneva Environment Network uh, uh, website and on social media uh, of the UK Mission and uh, the GEN uh, account. Um, I'm, I'm uh, certain that uh, we will have other sessions post COP26 because uh, accountability is also a key word and we want to deliver. We have no choice but to deliver. Thank you so, so much for your presence in the room and online. And uh, the GEN will have some events in the coming days, notably on nature-based solutions and cities. And, uh, and uh, I wish you a very good day forward and a good end of the week. Thanks.